What's up, guys? It's Q&A time on November 11th, 2018. Um, bear with me here. My nose is super congested. Um, hanging out with with Leo. So, And yes, those are Christmas lights in the background. We are fully decorated. Don't judge. <clears throat> so, with that out of the way, we will get right into this. This week's topic was off-season, so anything related to your off-season progression. Uh, let's see. <clears throat> okay. Well, actually, actually, first off, I had one on uh, through direct message, so I'll just do that one first. So it is about GDAs. What is your views on what are your views on using GDAs in an off season or growth phase versus uh, fat loss phase? Okay, so <clears throat> I'm probably going to be more keen on using them if I if I had to pick between the two. It's definitely definitely going to want to use them in the growth phase versus the fat loss phase more than likely, just because you know you're going to be more prone to insulin resistance and um, getting fat, obviously in the uh, growth phase, so you're probably going to have better, you know, better returns if you had to pick between the two. But uh, I mean, use it ideally, just use it, use them all the time if you, you know, if you need them. But um, yeah, definitely growth phase. It's going to help stave off some of that uh, insulin resistance a little bit longer and probably extend your, you know, your growth phase out a little bit. So, <clears throat> all right, let's see. Views on using keto approach with insulin around training to maintain ketosis. All right, so <clears throat> this is an interesting question. Um, I I had to ask for a little more context on this because I um, wanted to make sure I was understanding it correctly. So the person uses they they just respond really well to fat, so they plan on using a ketogenic approach in in the growth phase as well, which is okay. I mean there are legitimately people that that works good for if you can obviously if you can consume enough fat um <clears throat> and it's easier to stay in ketosis when you're in a surplus and you're using you know a ketogenic diet because you're just gonna you're essentially just gonna increase fats primarily and that's gonna be i mean obviously blood ketones are gonna be higher so now <clears throat> If you excuse me, if you really dig into ketosis and <clears throat> sorry, and the mechanisms by which you go into ketosis, how your body utilizes different energy substrates, uh, processes like gluconeogenesis. I mean, if you look into how that works, and then you also couple that with exercise. Um, <clears throat> and when I say exercise, there's exercise is going to have different effects. So anaerobic versus aerobic is going to be different. You know, they're going to utilize different, uh, different fuel sources. Um, but we're going to, you know, we're talking about weight training. So they're actually, actually weight training could, could potentially skew blood ketones some, because I mean, you are, you know, you're obviously, you have a couple things going on. You are releasing, um, <clears throat> adrenal hormones, right? So you have stress hormones, cortisol, uh, adrenaline. So, you know, as a result of training and because you're, you know, firing up your nervous system, you're getting going for training. And you're also, you know, utilizing, heavily utilizing energy substrate versus just when you would normally just be sitting and doing nothing uh, because, you know, you're training. So you could, I've actually seen some super hardcore keto, uh, keto zealots, I guess, talk about certain, you know, training certain ways and stuff, and you're not want to ruin your ketosis. I think that's kind of ridiculous, especially for, especially for what we're talking about here. So <clears throat> we're not necessarily talking about therapeutic ketosis here. It's not like, you know, it's not like even if the person broke their ketosis for halfway through their session and then, you know, 30, 45 minutes are out of ketosis, as soon as they eat again, they're going to go back into ketosis with sufficient fats. I mean, everything's going to shift again. Um, yeah, I don't, I'm just not, not too worried about that small window there. If, if they were to actually bump out of ketosis a little bit, the, the results aren't going to, you know, aren't going to be dampered. Now, 
if you're having someone take in like a huge amount of uh, amino acids or, or uh, like hydrolyzed protein or something during the training, then obviously that too could cause, um, cause some insulin activity. So, and then they mentioned insulin. Yeah. Insulin, the insulin itself could interrupt, um, could interrupt some of those blood ketones too. I mean, and I'm talking like if you're actually sitting there, you're, you know, you're pissing on a ketone stick or you're measuring blood ketones. I, you know, some of the people use like the, the little, uh, it's like, it's like a glucometer, but it measures ketones, a key ketometer. We'll call it a ketometer. Um, <clears throat> so, but, but again, like, like I was saying, I don't really think any of this is super, it's super important at the end of the day. It's really going to make no difference in the grand scheme of results because the calories, you know, calorically, everything's going to be the same. So whether or not the person actually jumps out of ketosis briefly is not really, uh, you know, that's, that's not really the problem. Uh, now, as far as using insulin, yeah, I mean, the probably, you know, I'm not going to be using like a, like a rapid insulin, like humologers or even a medium, medium to fast, like, you know, uh, Novolin R, uh, but someone could, I mean, someone could probably use Lantus on, uh, or, or a basal insulin on, um, a ketogenic diet and still technically stay in ketosis if as long, you know, depending on how much they use. And I know I'm going, I'm going off in different directions too, but also with chronic ketosis and, um, super high fats for a long time, you actually might see high blood sugars just from that. So there's, there's a name for it. And I'm not going to get, I'm not going to go into that whole side shtick, but, uh, there are some people that will end up with high fasting sugars just from, just from long-term, uh, you know, ketosis. And it's not necessarily a bad thing either, but again, that maybe that's something I can cover in a different video, but, uh, hope that answers the question. It's probably not going to be relevant. Um, if blood ketones are high enough, even using some of those blood ketones aren't, it's not really going to take you out of ketosis. And if it does, it's not going to be long. So that's kind of the, the deal there. <clears throat> uh, I should add too with the basal, if someone is using growth hormone, then obviously that's going to skew the, the blood glucose and that's where the lantus and stuff may come in a little bit more but be cool to actually monitor the blood ketones and see what kind of effect you have there uh just because most of the people that you're going to read about online that are doing a lot of blood ketone monitoring and, and and messing with extremely high fats and stuff they're probably maybe not using any exogenous hormones like that so you know you're going to have some different results uh okay so next one do you or would would you utilize liquid shakes as is easier to get the calories in knowing I'm sure food is king, but especially uh, but when pushing food, being hungry would be ideal. Discuss. So yeah, I mean it's not it's not particularly pleasant if you don't have any hunger, you just don't want to eat, and I, I don't see anything wrong with um anything wrong with, with shakes. I mean, if you're, if every single meal is whey protein, I could argue you might be missing out on some micronutrients, but those could even be supplemented. I mean, there's been instances where people have, people have done these flexible dieting or IIYFM experience or whatever experiments, you know, whatever you want to call it. And they've used just protein shakes and, and, uh, some kind of processed carbohydrate source or something. And yeah, and it works. So I'm not saying that's necessarily what you want to do from a health standpoint, but from a body composition standpoint, I mean, you could do it. Now, <clears throat> with the shakes, uh, it's easy to make. The thing about the shake is it's easy to add nutrients to. It's easy to make it a, is it a protein fat-based meal? Is it a protein carbohydrate meal? Is it a mixed meal? You know, what do you want to do with the shake? You can start with your base powder, but you can add things like greens powders that are flavored to match whatever flavor profile you want. You can add fibers. You can, if you want, you can add uh, fat sources like oils or um, almond butter or uh, you know nut butters, things like that. I mean, uh, chia seeds. I mean, there's a lot of things that you can add to it. Carbohydrates can easily be added via powder, via adding like fruit, blended up or just thrown in there. Um, 
even things like, you know, the powdered sources too could be starch powders like, uh, you know, potato powders. Um, I mean, there's a million and a half things that you could add to, to change the, the composition, nutritional composition of the shake to match what you need. So, yeah, I don't really see anything wrong with it. Uh, um, okay. Do you feel meal timing, portioning carbohydrates, proteins, fats evenly through the day makes that much of a difference in mass phases compared to eating as much or little? of each macro each meal if the trainee is hitting the same macros okay so i assume they're asking just essentially you know does uh does macro timing matter in off season um okay <coughs> from <coughs> from a body composition standpoint it probably means not a whole lot uh really not a whole lot now does it mean nothing? No, probably not. If you want to really look at, you know, how, what energy substrates your body's using at certain times, uh, it, it could make sense to separate, um, separate the, the main energy source is going to be your, your glucose or carbs and your lipids or your fats. So, um, <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, if you want to split hairs, yeah, I don't see anything wrong with timing and splitting works great for a lot of people and there's a lot of people that do mixed meals and that works just fine now there are other things to consider you know as the person what's the person's hormonal profile like what if there's any hormone different things being used it means that could potentially make a difference now another thing that i would probably look at that might be even more significant is just how you feel and how you function with different macronutrients Sometimes the whole idea of people timing carbohydrates around training uh, is just because they feel better. They feel more stable and even on proteins and fats uh, rather than having insulin and blood sugar levels, you know, going up and down to peaks and valleys. Uh, so that could be a reason that they want to, a reason that they want to have those protein fat based meals away from training, maybe when they're working or they're, you know, whatever they're doing just to have a stable energy substrate and just have stable mood and everything's stable. Now, uh, to be honest, to give you some honest, like, uh, practical feedback here, I've, excuse me, I've had clients that I've done that with and they just don't feel that good. I mean, they don't feel bad. They just feel, you know, they just don't feel the best they could and I've actually added carbohydrates in so like the idea of you know rotating carbs out on a non-training day for example and they they're just like ah, I don't really feel that good um okay that's fine calorically just flip flip it or maybe just flip it a little bit um I have one person I added just I added just little bits of fruit in during the day um, to some meals and that little bit of glucose or your fructose, I'm sorry, it's not glucose, mainly fructose. Well, not mainly depending on the fruit, but I'm not going to go into that. They've fructose and glucose together. So the sugar, it gave them a little bit of bump and a little bit of brain fuel, I guess. And they, you know, they feel better <coughs> placebo. Maybe, I don't know, but it doesn't, it's what's going to make you feel best. What's going to make you perform best. Um, you know, a, a mixed meal might not feel good before training. You might not, you have carbohydrates, fats, and proteins. The meal might digest really slowly and you feel kind of sluggish. You just want to take a nap afterwards. It's not going to be ideal to train with, right? Uh, I have pe plenty of people that don't eat carbohydrates before they train. They just don't feel, you know, they feel kind of tired and sleepy. Like serotonin boost be good to go to sleep, but not for training. Now, obviously they can just mask that with like a shitload of caffeine, but that's not really, you know, that's not really our goal. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, I would, I would base it off of, I would try to base it off of how you feel and what's going to make you perform best and go from there. Now, from a body composition standpoint, you might have some small differences. So if you don't mind splitting it, it's probably, it's worth trying. Um, but 
if for whatever reason you're completely against it and you hate the idea of it, then you don't have to do it. It's not going to, you know, you're not going to be a complete slob or anything. Uh, so, <clears throat> okay. Last one. Yep. Last one. <clears throat> At a higher body fat percentage in the off season, how can you still optimize muscle growth? Are there any strategies to use, enhanced or not, if applicable? Okay. <clears throat> Damn it, I can't stop my nose. I'm like I'm leaning forward, so my face feels like it's like 500 pounds. If I lean back, it looks looks really weird, doesn't it? So we won't do that. Tough it out. One more question. Okay, so um. <clears throat> strategies <clears throat> don't get fatter <laughs> you know don't try to get any fatter if you're if there's already fat now <clears throat> everyone grows different at certain body fat set points and there might be some people grow a little bit better with a little bit of fat on them <clears throat> and that's not necessarily a bad thing like they're like ah i gain you know they go through uh, a fat loss phase and they gain a little bit of fat back and they're freaking out but really maybe that's just where they need to be and maybe that's just what their body's settling point or set point is to feel good and function good um and grow from you know that might be that might be where they should be at uh to to grow their best so don't necessarily think that it's you know right off the rip that you're in trouble if you gain fat now you're saying higher body fat percentage that's it's such a vague you know that's kind of a vague uh question i don't know like how high are we talking I mean, if you're just a complete fat ass, like if you if you notice that everything you eat is partitioned to fat and nothing, you know, no lean tissue returns, then yeah, you're probably too too insulin resistant. You know, you're not gonna um, you're not gonna be able to grow efficiently. Now, look at I mean, look at some other things like look at some other markers like uh, like you know blood glucose levels and look at, um, uh, even look at fasting insulin levels, monitor, monitor your photos, obviously things like that. Um, just because you have some fat doesn't, like I said, doesn't mean you can't grow. And it also doesn't mean you're insulin resistant automatically. Some, like I said, some people settle just fine at a certain body fat percentage and grow there. Like I know about where mine is. And some people are going to be a little bit more and some people a little bit less. They grow better, leaner. And some people just don't grow that good when they're lean. They're just, their body fights it. And you can normally tell too because they will, like, it's like, it's a weird, it's kind of a weird phenomenon that your body's um, wanting to get back to that set point that once they start adding in a decent amount of calories, they actually notice that initially when they're leaner, they gain fat pretty quick. But once they hit a certain, uh, you know, certain body fat, they actually, like, they hit a good stride, and they're like, "Oh, I'm filling out," you know. I don't, and I don't really look like I'm gaining any more fat. Well, that's because their body wanted to regain fat and, re and fill up those adipose cells, and you know, get back to a certain point before it wanted to allow any new 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 muscle tissue growth or you know, new lean tissue growth. So they needed to gain the fat. They it was going to happen one way or the other. Just one was going to be slow or fast. Yeah, I mean, obviously it's not a... Maybe you don't want to gain it back super fast and or overblow the amount of fat that you need to gain. But um, but yeah, I see that. It is kind of a weird thing. But, it, but if you think about it, um, what your body is attempting to do, it makes a whole lot of sense. You know, it makes sense that you are going to gain... Uh, you might gain fat back pretty quick because your body's like, hey, we need to get this fat back and the fat cells, we need to get you back to being alive and not starving and hold this fat just in case you try to starve us again. So uh, yeah, I wouldn't necessarily look at it as a bad thing if I would maybe just give it some time and uh, monitor those things I talked about and, and see how you do. So uh, yep. All right, guys, that is it for today. I will get this up for everyone, and we'll do it again next week.